A century ago, German colonizers almost wiped out an indigenous people in southwest Africa. Germany's now apologized, but Namibians have labeled a compensation offer of more than a billion dollars an insult. So how should countries deal with injustices committed in the past? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Sahil Rahman. It's been called the first genocide of the 20th century. More than 100 years ago, German soldiers killed tens of thousands of indigenous people from two ethnic groups in what's now Namibia. Last week, Germany apologised and agreed to pay $1.3 billion for infrastructure projects over the next 30 years. But Namibia's vice president says that's nowhere near enough. And descendants of the victims say it's an insult and doesn't provide them with any sort of reparation. The case is reigniting the debate on how countries should deal with past atrocities. For Mida Miller reports. While it's taken more than a century, Germany's admitted it committed genocide against tens of thousands of Nama and Ovaharero people in Namibia. We will now officially call these events what they were from today's perspective, a genocide. In doing so, we are acknowledging our historical responsibility. In the light of Germany's historical and moral responsibility, we will ask Namibia and the descendants of the victims for forgiveness. But it's taken years of negotiations for Germany to apologize. Community leaders had tried through courts to compel the German government to pay reparations for the extermination of nearly 100,000 Nama and Ovaharero people. This took place during Germany's early 20th century colonization of what was then Southwest Africa. While the court bids failed, in May, Germany agreed with the Namibian government to provide $1.3 billion in development aid for the next 30 years. Germany has been dictating. And, and for me, it was like a, a case of a, you have a murderer or a rapist, and this person is the one to decide whether I have raped or not, and should I find myself guilty, what could be the best punishment or verdict that I can give myself? So that, that is how the whole process uh, was not acceptable to us. There are others too who say the negotiations between the two governments excluded those directly affected by the genocide. We first met Ida Hoffman four years ago. She's been fighting for the direct payment of compensation. She fears the development aid will never reach the communities affected. They have killed our people. They took our land. They took our resources. Our people have become the poorest of the poor. During the genocide, these communities were robbed of their land and cattle. Today, many say they continue to suffer the legacy of being displaced. And that this chapter in Namibia's history remains unresolved. Famida Miller, Al Jazeera. Well, in recent months, several communities around the world have stepped up calls for reparations relating to historical atrocities. Indigenous groups in Canada are suing the government for the cultural damage caused by residential schools. Rwandan opposition parties are demanding an apology and reparations for France's role in the 1994 genocide. And many Algerians want compensation for abuses committed during France's colonial rule. The UN Human Rights Chief has urged countries to confront the legacy of colonialism and make amends for violence. Well, let's bring in our guests for this edition of Inside Story. In Windhoek, we have Penna Brock, a researcher on transitional justice and a project consultant at the Namibia Institute for Democracy. In Uppsala, in Sweden, Henning Melber, senior research associate at the Nordic Africa Institute and a member of the SWAPO, that's the Southwest Africa People's Organisation Liberation Movement. And in London... Professor Phil Clark of the International of International Politics and uh, co-director of the Centre of Conflict, Rights and Justice at uh, SOAS University of London. Welcome all to the programme. Uh, Miss Penner, can I uh, start with you I in Windhoek? Apologies are a huge step, aren't they, uh, for those who want to say that they did something wrong. 
it's a bigger and more difficult step sometimes to accept when your ancestors have been the victims and those apologising weren't there at the time. Mm. Um, I think that's interesting, the apology aspect, especially when it comes to, to reparations, because the apology should be an outcome of a process that takes place before of consistent engagement between the perpetrators and the victims, or so to say, the descendants mm. of um, perpetrators and victims. The Herero, Nama and Damara groups, they continue to identify as victims and not descendants of victims because they do feel that the process, um, that the inherited injustices continue to make them victims. However, when it comes to the apology from the German side, I think maybe that's where a lot of the hesitation comes from. People feeling that, well, I wasn't there or I didn't do it. And ultimately, I think with reparations, mm. the important symbolic nature of it is to really shift the debate, not you know, about punishment or, or anything. It's about in, an inherited responsibility. And we cannot start to go, go further unless we start to think about the symbolic nature of reparations, of acknowledgement, mm -hmm. of knowing our history, knowing the role or what we've inherited. So, okay. so it's not to feel that you're being slapped on the hand and being forced to apologize, but that you actually mean it. Okay, let's move over then to uh, Henning Malva, because if it's about the indignities a community has experienced and an apology is part of the way there, uh, from your understanding and your knowledge and your experience, so what are the main issues now that Namibians and the Nama and Ova Hero communities want addressed? I think, first of all, it's about a full recognition of the genocide committed and the irreversible consequences it had, both in terms of democracy and social economic structures which are part of the social reality of Namibia today. And I think there is a certain mismatch reflecting the asymmetric power relations, because while in Germany it at best is considered a footnote of German history, that is not a past in Namibia, but it's the present, and it's very much alive, especially among the Ovahirero and Nama and Damara communities, who all were victims of the genocide. And while it's important to offer an unreserved apology, that should have been the first step before negotiating. Let's keep in mind, Germany admitted in 2015 that yes, what happened then is from a today's perspective, genocide. And then they said, now let's open bilateral uh, negotiations with the Namibian government, how best to apologize. I think that is adding insult to injury. And of course, I think the debate about the apology and the finance will continue, certainly, uh, for the weeks and months ahead. So we can put that slightly to one side and I come over to Professor Clark in London. I mean, in Northern Europe, where you are in London, much is taught in schools across the board about World War II, colonialism, uh, and it's focused around the events of Northern Europe and the colonies and, and taught from a Northern European experience. And, and as Mr. Uh, Melba just said there, you know, it's a footnote sometimes about what happened in Africa. But the colonies and events in, in, in those continents barely get a mention and are barely understood by the public at large. Does Namib Namibia's experience now have to be retaught in, in Germany in the way that the Germans had to relook at the way they behaved when it was a Nazi state during World War II? I, I think that's right, that what both of your previous guests have emphasised is the importance of acknowledgement, that before we talk about apology and reparations, uh, former colonial powers have to honestly and fully acknowledge the crimes of the past, their direct actions in various parts of Africa. And I don't think we're seeing that from these European powers at the moment. I think we're seeing these piecemeal forms of acknowledgement um, that sometimes dodge some of the toughest issues of what Britain did in its colonies, what Germany did in its former colonies. And 
part of that acknowledgement, I think, is expressed towards victim communities in places like Namibia, in Rwanda, in Sudan and elsewhere. But part of that acknowledgement is also inside those European societies themselves. It's education, it's uh, public museums and monuments. It's about having a, an honest domestic debate about the, the nature of colonial crimes. And I think that most of these European states at the moment are, are incredibly reluctant to have that kind of conversation in Africa and very reluctant to have that kind of conversation at home. And indeed, I, I know that uh, Penn is uh, nodding in agreement and we'll come back to you in a moment because uh, before I go, uh, Professor Clark, uh, the terminology you see is so very difficult to accept, isn't it? When you mention the word genocide, we've seen certain countries who don't want to acknowledge that they were perpetrators of genocide, uh, and it's an important term legally as well. So what sort of effect does that word have, you might say, in this context with Namibia and with Germany, still really talking about uh, their very tenuous relationship and historical um, issues? I think something we have to recognise about the Namibian case is that Germany was dragged kicking and screaming into this dialogue with the Namibian government. Uh, Germany didn't want to be there. They didn't want to acknowledge the genocide. It was only because Namibian activists had started taking legal cases uh, into foreign jurisdictions that Germany got a bit spooked and decided that they needed to look into this case. It should also be remembered that Germany's first response to the Herero genocide was to offer a very paltry sum of only uh, 10 million euros and it was Herero and Nama community groups that said that's simply not enough. If you've committed genocide here and we're still, as communities, living with the legacies of that genocide today, we need something that is much more substantial and much more meaningful. And so I think all of that raises some very serious questions about the sincerity and the honesty with which Germany is, is engaging with Namibia. And of course, this isn't just about Germany. We could mm. argue very similarly about Belgium and France and the Netherlands and, and, and the UK as well in exactly this, this same conversation. And I'll be touching on those hopefully a little bit later. But of course, uh, Penny, you were nodding in agreement uh, in Wintook. And basically that voice uh, about it, the reparations not being good enough, the situation not being good enough, was initially accepted by the vice president, uh, Mabumba. Um, now, he urged Namibians at the time to remain calm, and I'm quoting it, and think deeply about their response to the deal. We have made remarkable progress over the past five years of negotiations, and there is an opportunity we should not waste. Yet he's changed his tune, hasn't he? He's not very happy with this uh, offer by Germany. What seems to have happened? What's changed for him to, to change his mind? I can only speculate that it boiled down to the reaction of the Namibian public at large. I'm sitting here in Namibia almost every day in the newspaper. It's about another chief who has disagreed with it, a public joint statement by the Herero Nama chiefs, activist groups um, speaking up about it. So I think it is correct to say it, it, is, a, it is a huge um, improvement to what's been happening, especially when you look at the history of this um, process to get to this point. However, I think the way the public is reacting is that because it's been such a process, it is just getting more and more frustrating. And I think the vice president has to take into account the, the views of the, the Namibian public. He knows that, and everyone knows that reparations has to be accepted by the people for it to actually have the impact that you want it to have. I guess that's, mm. that's the main issue, the, the main developments that's been happening here in the public okay. in Namibia. Uh, uh, Henning Melba in Uppsala, uh, is that how you see it from where you are? Because obviously you've had years of being able to research and in-depthly in speak to the people at the heart of the problem? Well, as I pointed out, the perceptions in Namibia are entirely different from those in Germany. And Professor Clark made reference to a very important point. Actually, as a Herero activist pointed out, if the German president is supposed to offer an apology he, as a first step, should do so in Germany to bring the message back home what happened in the German colony then, to create a minimum awareness in German society today, what there was before the Holocaust, before going to Namibia and then trying to close a chapter which is not closed by such an insufficient agreement. Now, first of all, 
while material compensation, and the Germans desperately avoid the term reparations, is an important part of an apology, we will never ever can compensate for the loss of human life and the irreparable consequences it had. There is more to be done. And reconciliation, if there is a way for reconciliation, needs to be between and among people and not governments. And that's already a flaw in the current negotiations. Obviously, there are many examples around the world that we can look at that are very similar and have this fine thread of apology and reparations and understanding. Um, Phil Clark, can I come to you? I mean, we've seen in South Korea, for example, over the years uh, after World War II, that forgiving Japan uh, and its behaviour towards Korean comfort women has never really been settled, dis dis despite agreements between the two governments, uh, despite a financial agreement and a political agreement, it still festers as an issue uh, to this day. And one wonders, even if you do have financial, you might say, uh, an ending, uh, finality to it, is this something that could fester for Namibians in the same situation that the South Koreans have found themselves in for, what, nearly 70 years? Yes, I, I think that's the danger, that if issues of apology and reparations aren't handled well, it, it compounds the original crime. Uh, there's an opportunity now to acknowledge the past, to do something constructive about it, but if that's handled in a piecemeal fashion, if that's handled poorly, it, it can, in fact, make the situation much worse. I, I think the difficulty in the Germany-Namibia case is that, of course, Germany has a, a previous experience of large-scale reparations uh, towards the Jewish population after the Holocaust. And there's much debate about the effectiveness or otherwise of that. But in that case, Germany at least did seem to fully try to come to terms with crimes committed during the Holocaust. And there was a systematic attempt at reparations for the Jewish people. Now, the, the Namibian case inevitably is being compared and contrasted with that. And, and at the moment, I think, uh, as Penne and, and Henning have both emphasised, uh, the deal with Namibia seems to be falling short. Um, Germany has a history of, of engaging clearly and systematically on this question of reparations, but we're seeing something very, very different in the Namibian case. And that's the kind of thing that I think could cause a lot of bad blood and, and could fester for a very long time. Uh, Penne, Brock and Windhoek, how difficult was it for the local communities to actually, you know, get their voice heard. We've heard that it's been, you know, decades, mm -hmm. nearly a hundred years to get to this particular point. But can you just give us an example of a, of a voice that you've spoken to who had ancestors that had been at the forefront, had been victims of what they experienced? Can you give us an example of an experience uh, of the treatment of Germans towards uh, native uh, Namibians? Um... Well, during my during my research, I, I conducted some interviews and there's also some work done by Casper Eriksson, which is one of the very few bodies of work that actually captures the oral histories of the Herero Nama and Damara communities. And a lot of it, a lot of identity today is shaped by these atrocities and issues around around land and restoration. And I think what's so important to remember while we're discussing, especially when we hear some rhetorics by German government officials to say, well, the, the genocide was such a long time ago. The first attempt for restoration was in 1919. That's um, well over a century ago, where Jose Kotaka actually, or the, the, the chief at the time actually asked for land back so that the Herero people can live as a nation once again. That needs to be understood in a context of settler colonialism. And the fact that then it was brought up again in the 1920s, it was brought up again at the UN in 1949 onwards. So when we have to understand that the opportunity, especially under colonialism, and I, I hear us talking about the Holocaust and Germany's willingness to acknowledge the Holocaust and make amends, very different okay. contexts. And at the end of the day, Germany has had a year, I mean, so has had um, over a century of protection based on the international politics of the time of decolonization. Okay. 
the Namibian groups asked as early as 1995, exercising their democratic rights, Namibia being mm. one of the last countries to receive democracy. Of course, it's, it's late, but not late on our part. It's okay. overdue justice. It, 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 let me just bring in uh, Henning Malva here, because, you know, we talk about um, uh, the pressure put on Germany, kicking and screaming perhaps as well, uh, to come to these talks. In 2019, there was a, a UN report that was damning of Belgium's colonial past in Congo, and it suggested quite strongly, and I quote, with a view to closing the dark chapter in history as a means of reconciliation and healing. There are several other UN-backed investigations um, about colonial rule and how colonial powers may need to uh, face their past sooner rather than later. Is it up to bodies like the UN, if you can deem them independent, to actually tell nation states you need to look at your colonial past? The UN might try to put moral pressure on those colonial powers, but I'm afraid realpolitik is different. Let's remember ECOSOC already in the 1980s adopted a report which qualified the war against the Ovaherero and the Nama as the first genocide of the 20s century. So it's almost 40 years on record. Let's also remember that after World War I, the Treaty of Versailles took away the German colonies with the argument that German colonial policy disqualified them as civilizers. Now, at the risk of being cynic cynical, but um, the terms of reparations are actually decided by those who have the power of definition and not by those who were defeated, meaning the Ovaherero and the Nama never had a chance. But at the Versailles Treaty, the other colonial powers dealt with Germany as mm. one of the colonial powers, which was defeated. But for obvious reasons, they did not impose reparations on Germany for the colonial atrocities, despite the fact that they pointed to the colonial atrocities. Uh, Professor Clark, you were nodding in agreement there. Can I just bring you in on this whole issue of reparations and how colonial powers deal with each other, and also this issue of the UN and where it stands in a modern 21st century? I mean, I think one of the things that the UN has been emphasising in the last 10 years or so is that especially in many parts of Africa, colonialism in many ways didn't die. Uh, the the, the neo-colonialism of these European actors is also very important. It's not only about uh, European states dealing with things that happened in the colonial period, it's also about how they relate to African states today. Are, are they doing trade on equal terms? Are, are there development packages formulated according to the needs of local people as opposed to uh, power brokers in, in European capitals? Um, that this whole issue... Uh, about decolonizing isn't only about doing redress for events 10, 50, 30, uh, 50 years ago. It's it's also about more equal uh, relationships today. And I think that is something that many European states, even though there's UN pressure, are still very reluctant to engage with. Certainly one to watch and certainly a very interesting development, certainly for Southern Africa. Unfortunately, there we have to leave uh, the programme, but it's been uh, fascinating speaking to all of you. I'm sure we'll be revisiting this subject in the not too distant future. Uh, to my guests, Penna Brock in Windhoek, uh, Henning Melba in Uppsala in Sweden, and to Professor Phil Clark in London. Thank you so much for joining me on this edition of Inside Story. And thank you for watching as well. Now you can see all of our previous programmes again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com and for further discussion go to our Facebook page and that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Now you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. From me and the Inside Story team, thanks very much for your time and your company.